So today we're going to be talking about tent pegs because they come in many shapes and sizes. These things get left all over our, uh, our great British outdoors. I've, I've just got a cross section here in my hands. Um, they're mainly made of aluminium, sometimes stainless steel, sometimes they're painted, sometimes they're not. And there's lots of different working designs. But nevertheless, they get literally left all over the place. And think of how many times you've been camping and not quite come back with all your tent pegs. I personally hold my hand up through my entire, my teens and generation of just, at the end of the day, I've switched off. I'm just packing everything back into a bag and I'm already thinking about going home for a nice hot shower. And I'm, I'm leaving tent pegs all over the place. Um, you know, thinking back, I, I really was. So now, wherever possible, I'll either take some ready-made, seasoned, lovely handmade tent pegs with me, or I'll just make them in situ. So today I'm going to take you through making tent pegs, how to, uh, to do that. So something like this would be the ideal diameter, but sadly, yep, that's dead. Okay, so what we're looking for is something alive, so green wood. Um, we'll leave that there. All of this kind of spindly growth here, and this is Hazel, this is our old friend Hazel. All this spindly growth is, is, is no good, there's no tensile strength to that. But this one here, however, looks ideal. And that's about as straight as it gets people, and that goes all the way up. So there is easily a full set of six pegs inside here to be had. This actual piece isn't doing an awful lot in the canopy because it's trying to compete with everything else around it. So I'm not gonna feel bad at all about taking this down. So as always, I really wanna respect the root collar, this thick section where it goes from being off the main body and into the branch because I want to promote the growth of another branch afterwards and so all I'm going to do is come a good sort of inch up from that uh, that growth and bring this thing down. So no need for a step cut for this one because it was growing straight up. If there was any sort of lean on it I'd have given it the step cut. <laughs> right let's just bring this down and make it manageable, make it safe. Okay, so a great little technique to use for this, as I haven't got anything to, uh, to lean on or to rest this inside, is the Dutch sawmill. Okay, which has got a bit of a funny name, but that's what I was taught it as. So there we go, left foot goes over right foot, because I'm right-handed, traps the piece of wood in here. It means that I'm working from here to here, rather than picking things up, bending down, and using more calories all the time. So we think about the length of our, our tent pegs and how, what, how long we want these things to be. I'm probably gonna go for this time of year. Okay, we're heading into winter. Ground's a little bit wetter, um, or pretty much is winter. So uh, I'm gonna give myself an extra couple of inches there just to really drive this thing in. So I'm probably gonna go for something in about, about this sort of length. And then, just for uniformity and because people get really carried away making these things and really OCD, I'm going to make sure that with every one I try to match that length, a humble tent peg. So the first thing I'm going to do with this piece of hazel is just inspect it and I'm looking for any knots or imperfections or area where, areas where branches were coming out just to, uh, to make my life easier basically. And I'm going to decide which end is going to be the pointed pencil sharp edge that gets driven into the ground and which end is going to be the end that gets struck with probably another piece of wood as a hammer, improvised hammer, and driven into the ground to do its job as a tent peg. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this, and just because I've roughly cut it, to save myself doing any more work, I've decided this will be the pencil end, just because it's the worst cut of the two. Uh, it just means that if I struck this with a hammer, it's not going to make as good a contact, so uh, to save myself on some work, I'll just make this the pointed end, and that'll be the nice end that gets hit with the hammer. Okay, simple. So all I'm gonna do is take my knife in my hand in a full grip, and uh, I'm right-handed, so I'm working over my right-hand side, supporting this with my left hand, and all I'm gonna do is from about an inch down or just over an inch down, I'm just gonna push and turn, push and turn, push and turn, and just be patient. If you've got a good sharp knife, okay, the knife's gonna do the work for you. I'm not pushing especially hard, I'm not having to push through any knots. 
Okay, it's just take your time, just keep going round, and it's about uniformity. Ultimately, it's just doing a job, it's getting driven into the ground, and that's it. Okay, another technique I'll just show you now very quickly. If you do encounter a bit of a knot or something difficult, take your knife here and turn it like a sundial, pretty much level with your knuckles, okay? Bring this in tight here, grab hold of the piece of work you're using. Feel free to make the noises, I know, sound mad. And then using that same belly of the blade, that first inch coming out of the handle, that same belly of the blade, really pick up that edge and use the muscles in your back now as you contract. So as I contract, okay, I'm pulling big powerful cuts off of here, okay? And I'm able to remove a lot of material a lot faster using this technique. Uh, it is possible to have that same level of finesse it just takes a bit of practice. Okay, so quite quickly I've made a, a rough pencil point. If I really wanted to be an absolute perfectionist, I'd keep going round and keep chasing my tail and keep perfecting and making sure that everything was beautifully level. Now the pitch of your temp peg is quite important actually. If you make it so utterly fine that it hasn't got any structural integrity, because remember this is getting driven down through the soil, past roots, past stones and things like that. Um, you can make it too spindly at the top, it could just bend over on you, even if you have gone through the next process we're going to talk about, which is fire hardening. So if I had a fire on next to me right now, what I would do is just basically, here's the fire, okay, I would just place the temp peg in just underneath the ash bed, okay, so it's underneath the fire where it's still absolutely red hot, but there's no oxygen getting to it, and I'd leave it there for about a minute, maybe turn them halfway through, and then pull this back out. Now what will have happened is the tip will be black and all of this will be sort of, it looked like it's smoking, it's just water escaping, okay? So you're driving out all of the moisture for the top couple of millimeters of your tent peg, making it fire hardened. A technique put to good use against us by the Romans when they built their forts and they dug a huge ditch all the way around and laid stakes, whole trees, were fire hardened all the way around, but just with one drawbridge in and out. And this is, uh, is time-tested stuff here. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to the other end. And all I'm gonna look to do here is chamfer off the top. Now, the technique I'm gonna use here is kind of like an assisted push cut. So I'm, I'm in that primary push cut position, but my thumb, which was holding onto the temp peg, so is gonna work its way down and it's gonna push on the spine of the knife. And I'm just gonna use my right hand just to place the belly of the blade up near the handle here onto the top corner and I'm going to use that thumb now on the other hand to just drive off and chamfer off that top edge. Anyone who's ever driven a tent po uh, a post into the ground with a sledgehammer um, will know exactly what I'm on about now uh, because quite quickly what happens is all the energy is striking the top here and the weakest point is around the rim and it starts to splay and mushroom out and split through the middle and so forth. So what you really wanna do is keep all that kinetic energy of that hammer head of that piece of wood or whatever it is running straight through the center of the pin and straight into the ground. Okay, that's why we do this. Now there's one last thing or two last things left to do. One is to peel all of the bark off the outside. So if you wanna use this thing in the future to prevent something called white rot, which is essentially where uh, it's like a fungal attack that takes place between the outer bark and the wood itself and the inner bark. So we're gonna take all that off so that when this season's up, okay, so I take it back to the house and it lives in the garage or whatever, it's gonna get harder and harder and more and more usable uh, over the years. Uh, a good piece of hazel will actually last quite a long time. Um, that said, these get quite a lot of use. They're submerged in mud, um, so they will rot away eventually. But again, it's a biodegradable product, which is amazing. So you haven't really got to worry. So first thing I'm gonna do now, is just peel off, uh, all, made all the easier with a sharp knife, just peel off all that outer bark to stop that white rot from taking place. Okay, and I'm just using the belly of the blade, I'm just gliding that over, um, and the bevel is doing the work. I'm not having to dig it in or push too hard, okay? We'll go down on that side as well, bosh. Okay, so I've got something that pretty much could be used as a temp peg as is, as long as, let's say my tarpaulin's on this side, okay, let's say, I've banged that in at that angle, my tarpaulin's here, I can still wrap my paracord around the outside. But to make it that bit more usable, what I'm gonna to need to do is quite possibly put in 
a cut underneath here just to really help that paragord to, uh, to lip on. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use another temp peg, probably use my, uh, my seat here to demonstrate this. Ugh, and I'm gonna create a little stop cut. I'm going to swap the knife into my left hand and I'm gonna hit the spine of the knife, okay? So you'll notice I'm using the belly of the blade again, just over there like that. And we're gonna strike the spine. I'm only gonna strike it a couple of times. Now as a unit of measure, I'm looking to go, let's go a bit more. I'm looking to go about as deep as the bevel. If you have a look here, I've pretty much gone as deep as the bevel. Rather than pull this straight back towards myself, I merely roll the piece of work away. Simples, okay? And now all I'm gonna do is using that same assisted push cut with the thumb, is I'm gonna come below the stop cut I've just made and just start to push off the material. Now these things don't have to be glamorous, like I say. You can put as much or as little craft effort into making these. Um, they're a throwaway item. Or if you wanna make one, you know, you're gonna keep about and keep for camping, keep for best and all that sort of stuff, then you can go a little bit, uh, a little bit more. You can personalize them. I've seen people uh, take uh, blackberries and things like that and scrape their name into them with a knife and then use the berries to, to sort of like number them and all kinds of stuff over the years. It's quite interesting what people, what people will do. Now I've just noticed what I'm doing here is I'm just removing material underneath here, okay? Just driving it off with this thumb. And then if it doesn't start to come off and you end up with this, what we call like a, like a petaled effect, just place it back down. And this is where I quite like the curvature on this particular blade, just to jump in and, uh, and chase that stuff out. Try and tidy it up a little bit if it's looking a bit untidy. Okay, so there we go. You haven't really got to go crazy with this thing because at the end of the day, like I said, it's a functional piece of kit. As long as it does what it's supposed to, um, nobody's going to lose too much sleep over it. But that said, as this is a YouTube video, <laughs> I'm going to try to put a, a little bit more effort in here. Okay, so that will do basically. Now the test is the old bootlace test. So let's have a look here. Find me a shoelace. Okay, so I've got a nice shoelace and all I do is I teach the students to put that through there. Will it bite down on there, yes or no? Answer is yes, clearly. Okay, so that's one tent peg. Uh, and that, that method is basically a stop cut and removing the material underneath. There's another one I'd like to show you, uh, and that's the bird's beak. Okay, so to make the bird's beak cut, what we want to be doing is trying to put a, a cross into the top of this piece of wood here. So I'm going to take, place this down onto a, a decent surface. Knife's going to go from right into left, and it's going to lay across the top here. Okay, so rather than do what I just did and lay it uh, horizontally, I'm going to lay it at an angle. And again, driving it in as far as the bevel, like so. Rolling the piece of work away from myself. Going back again. Try and make this a decent cross. Okay, like that, rolling the piece away. And you can see I've cut a cross into the top of the wood here. What I'm now looking to do is remove parts one, two, and three, leaving just this V at the top. So to do that, I'm going to start off much the same way and that I'm going to place my knife underneath here and try and join up the two bottom parts of my cross. Okay, I'm going to roll the piece of work away and then very carefully I'm going to use a sort of scissoring motion with my thumb coming up to the side here. Okay, and I'm going to drive this up the side like that and it should start to, it's already starting to fall out there. There's one come off. Okay. There's another one that's about to fall off there. Now to get this one, I'm actually gonna come down at it from this angle and just drive that under there. So you can see already that beak starting to form. And all I need to do now is just accentuate that. Um, so as I said, I'm sort of using this kind of scissoring motion off my, from my thumb here. But don't be afraid to, to rehash your, your, uh, your markings if you're not quite happy with them. Okay, remember you can lean on a surface. So what I should now have 
and you can see where they call it this. It's a sort of bird's beak. If you look side on, you can see this beak cut that's happened here. Now where this comes in really, really handy is when we're making pot hangers and things like that. You can literally use this beak. I'm going to put it in the B of the HVB knife here um, to create something that will that will sit on. And you could reverse this below this same cut and have your metal pot hung over the fire. So that's why it's always good to learn this one because it's all these skills are a follow on to something else in this uh, in the kind of wilderness living skills game. Everything kind of starts with one thing and then progresses onto another and another. For instance, I would normally teach people how to make feather sticks, tent pegs, and then we'd progress onto spoons that leads into cooks, cups, that leads into all sorts of other um, things like three-legged chairs, sawhorses, you know, all kinds of stuff. It all starts with these fundamental skills. So just to give you an idea about how these things work, place the tent peg in here as thus. Now, what I don't want to do is lay it over this side. So obviously that's counterproductive, right? We want to be driving it into the ground at this angle and then using one of our two hooking points to really then put together a lovely, uh, something like a figure of four uh, sliding knot would be perfect for this. So let me just use another would-be peg to drive this in. Let's just put my foot on there so it doesn't take off in the wind. So you can see I've really punished the top of this uh, and it's just taken it in spades. All that kinetic energy is driven through the pin, through the center of the pin or the, the, the peg for the fact that we've chamfered the top over. So now I can take my, my tarp and all I'm gonna do is like every knot I teach, I'm gonna go around it left to right, okay, as thus, and then I'm gonna lay this piece over the top of the taut piece that's gone round the peg, making a number four. So as I'm looking at this, I can see a number four. Then I'm gonna reach through the middle of the hole, okay, reach through the middle and pull through once. So I'm gonna reach through the middle here and pull through twice, okay. Now what's happened here is it's hopefully gonna to start to bite on itself. And to finish this knot off, I'm just gonna run around my little finger or a finger Okay, in the same way that we did with the beginning of the event, under and over, over the top. And as I pull my finger out of that hole, this piece that's left over is gonna go all the way through it. And I'm gonna pull all the way through to the end and tighten that down. So I'm gonna hold on to this knot I've just created, hold on to this left-hand side. I need to tighten this thing right up, okay? Or I can let some tension out like that. And that's how you not only make tent pegs, but then secure them properly with the correct knot.